Hey guys. All right, let's take a look now at our urinary system. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you guys so we can take a look now at chapter 20, uh, 24. We're looking at the urinary system again. Um, so let me get going here and I will talk to you guys about what we're gonna look at here. Again, as I mentioned in the last chapter, I covered this chapter with the digestive system because we are taking a look at how the body takes in and processes then waste products and how we eliminate the things that we don't need. Obviously here in the urinary system, we're talking about those liquid wastes. So let me show you guys what I mean. So here in the urinary system, we're gonna talk about the four organs of excretion. We actually have more than just our urinary system and how we eliminate waste products. Um, not just the digestive system, but how we eliminate other waste as well. I'll show you guys that here at the beginning. Uh, we will take a look at the major organs of the urinary system. I do have a labeling sheet that is going to go with uh, this chapter that you guys will use. This one is a much shorter labeling sheet than the one we looked at in our digestive system. Not a whole lot to label here. Um, we will take a look at the location, structure, uh, blood supply, nerve supply, everything kind of associated with the kidneys. The kidneys are your main organ that we're going to look at here in this chapter, as it's the kidneys that actually are going to be what creates urine. So that's what we're going to look at here. So our kidneys are going to be kind of the main focus here. Um, within the kidneys themselves, we have the main functional unit of the kidney is called a nephron. There's millions of nephrons inside each kidney, and we're gonna look at what that nephron is and how it plays a huge role in urine production. So I'll show you guys that. So we'll look at the nephron unit in that formation of urine. Uh, we'll then look at the three processes involved in the formation of urine. There's three, filtration, reabsorption, and then secretion. I'll explain this a little bit further as we get to that point in the PowerPoint, um, but really kind of a way to think about what urine production is, and this will probably make more sense when I get there, um, but we filter everything that we can out of blood. That's what your kidneys are. They're kind of like our body's filters. They filter all of this water and waste products out of our blood, and anything that can fit through blood will filter out. But then we have a double check process. That's the filtration part. But then we have this double check process that kind of makes sure that we keep all the things that we need and then make sure that we get rid of all the things that we need to get rid of. So that's where reabsorption and secretion are gonna come in. Those are kind of our cross check to make sure that that's what we're doing. So we'll get into that. Um, we'll take a look at the hormonal control of water and electrolytes by the kidney. So we'll take a look at how hormones play a big role in this. Uh, hormones that we're already hopefully pretty familiar with, so you'll see that. Uh, we'll real briefly look at the normal constituents of urine, so what makes up urine. And then we'll finish up with the last part of the anatomy of our urinary system. We'll just talk real briefly, uh, although we are gonna, are gonna label this here at the beginning, um, but we'll talk more about the structure and function of the ureters, urinary bladder, and urethra at the very end. All right, so let's talk about this. So our body excretes uh, things that we need to remove from our body, you know, waste products that we create. We excrete these things in a number of different ways. Um, we have the kidneys that are gonna help to excrete water and waste products and liquid waste. Our skin actually is an organ of excretion because of its ability to excrete a few wastes uh, in sweat. That sweat, although sweat is mainly functioning to help to keep us cool, in that process of excreting sweat out of our body, we are removing some waste in that, uh, in that excretion as well. Our lungs. Our lungs, remember how we talked about in our respiratory system that even though our lungs, you know, what we're doing is we're constantly taking in oxygen, utilizing the oxygen to um, provide our tissues with what they need. But remember, we also talked about how then we need to get rid of that waste gas called carbon dioxide. So there it is. We're removing waste by breathing air out. So our lungs are very much an organ of excretion as well. And then lastly, our intestines that we talked about in the last chapter, our intestines are helping our, our body to remove solid waste products in the form of feces. So we saw that um, in the last video. Um, so focusing on the urinary system though, we have a couple different organs that are the main organs here in the urinary system, and we're gonna label these on our labeling diagram. So kidney, ureter, bladder, and urethra. Um, but let's take a look at this. So we've got two kidneys. So because each kidney is gonna be what forms urine, and then urine we know will be stored in our bladder until we remove it. It's our bladder that we can fill 
with that urine and that's what we feel when it's time to go to the bathroom. Um, so what happens is that urine is created here in our filters, the kidneys, and then they will, that, that urine will exit through these tubes called the ureters and then will be temporarily stored here in the bladder at the time that that fills up, we will then be able to remove urine out of the bladder through this tube called the urethra. So let's identify these. On our labeling diagram that I have provided for you guys, um, this is a little bit more detailed because we're gonna talk about all of these different things in our, you know, throughout our PowerPoint. Um, but all four of those things that we just talked about are those four that are blank on your all's labeling sheet here. Number one is pointing to those kidneys. Number two is pointing to the ureters. Number three is pointing to the bladder. If you call it urinary bladder or just bladder, that's fine. And then number four is pointing to that urethra. Um, here in this diagram that you guys are looking at, um, as compared to the diagram that we just saw on the previous slide, the previous slide had a urinary system of a female. Here, we're obviously looking at the urinary system of a male. There is really no difference between the urinary systems of each gender. The only difference would be the length of the urethra. Here in the male, the length of the urethra will travel through that, uh, the length of the penis. So because of that, it is a little bit longer. But that's the only difference. We still have all the same parts of our urinary system, I should say. Reproductive system is a little bit different. We'll get into that next week. So a couple of different things I do want to point out on this diagram before we begin to talk about it. So what's going to happen? So here you're looking at the kidneys. We labeled those as number one. We're going to look a little bit deeper into the kidney. You can see the, the kidney over on the right of your screen, you can see is split open a little bit to show that the outside is called the cortex and the inside is called the medulla. Hopefully that's pretty familiar to us because we could do the same thing with the adrenal glands that sit right there at the top and that is pointed out for us as well. Now we'll be able to pinpoint that a little bit and I'll, I'll talk to you guys about that a little bit further. But here in red and blue, we know red and blue signifies our circulation in, in any diagram that we've looked at so far. It is showing our blood vessels here. So these red uh, blood vessels that are coming in, you can see, remember, arteries are coming away from the heart. This is oxygen rich blood coming towards the kidneys. We're going to deliver some oxygen to the tissue here, the kidneys. Um, but at the same time, it's going to fill filter through the kidneys and filter out any waste products that are also present in our, in our blood. And that's the idea of how this works. Kind of in a, in a nutshell, that's what's happening is blood is coming into the kidneys. We're going to filter out any wastes that might be present in the blood within those kidneys. And then the blood that comes out is fresh and clean is a way to think about it. So the blue that you're looking at, these, this is showing a vein as it's going towards the heart. Now it's deprived of oxygen because it's dropped off oxygen to our kidney. At the same time, it's been filtered through. So there is no waste products or anything present there. There might be some, but I mean, what could be filtered out will be, um, be now in, in urine. So and that's what that blue is showing us. So what we're looking at here, when it's, it's labeled this over here, the hilum, the hilum is simply just the medial region of each kidney, just where these blood vessels are gonna be able to come in and out of the kidney. So if you hear the term hilum, that simply just means this central location where that comes in. It's kind of like the doorway for the kidney is a way to think about that. So again, medial meaning it's in the middle um, uh, you know, of the body but then it's, it's right there at the kidney. It's kind of this doorway to the kidney on each side. So here's the hilum on this side and here's the hilum on this side. And that's where the blood vessels can come in and out and it's where the ureters are gonna exit from. So it's that renal vein, or I'm sorry, a renal artery in red that's being pointed out down there at the bottom that's bringing that blood into the kidney that's gonna then be filtered through here and then renal vein is gonna be what's coming out of the kidney that's taking that blood out and taking it back up towards the heart, as you can see by the direction of the arrows here. Once that filter is created, that urine will travel down those ureters through the process of peristalsis. Remember, we talked about peristalsis in our digestive system, those wave-like muscular contractions that are gonna to help to propel forward. Here, it's gonna happen with urine. 
that urine will be then propelled down towards the bladder where it's going to be temporarily stored. And we'll talk a little bit about the bladder and the structure of that bladder in our PowerPoint. I do want to point out that this diagram has labeled what's called the trigon. Um, there is an area at the base of your bladder that um, kind of forms a triangular shape. And that is because the openings of the ureters, there's two from, you know, one from each ureter at the top. And then the opening to the urethra at the base of the bladder forms that triangular formation in that, in, uh, you know, in that bladder itself. And that is just simply referred to as the trigon. So remember the triangular shape is called the trigon. Pretty easy to remember. Because we are looking at a male, re I mean, a male uh, system here, uh, we'll talk about the prostate gland. In males, we'll talk about that next week as that has a role in reproduction. Um, females will not have this underneath their bladder, but that's what we're looking at in this picture. So you don't need to worry about that for our urinary system. But then after that bladder becomes filled, it will then distend a little bit, send a signal to my brain, telling my brain that it's time to go to the bathroom. We will then be able to then go to the bathroom, relax our um, voluntary muscles, sphincters, and we'll be able to then release that. And it will travel out through this urethra. And then the opening at the end of the urethra is called the urinary metis. When you see that term metis, that typically, typically means opening. And here we're looking at the urinary metis at the end there. So that's, again, a couple things that are, are pointed out for us, but I want you guys to take a look at just kind of the summary here of the urinary system. I like that all of those things are pointed out on our diagram for us. It's a great way to study that urinary system to kind of get the gist of what's gonna take place in the creation of, of urine. So let's talk a little bit further about that. So here we can see a close-up view of the kidney again. And here, once again, we're seeing the renal artery coming in to this kidney, bringing that fresh blood in here to bring oxygen to this tissue and to, you know, again, we're going to filter, you know, things out of that blood. So it's brought into the kidney. It's then from, if you know, from that, what's going to happen is that filtration takes place. I'll show you guys how that's, you know, dive into this kidney a little bit further. It's going to take place and then eventually the renal vein will be what takes that blood out of the kidney. So there's a couple different regions here of the kidney itself. I just showed you guys on that previous slide that the outer part is called the cortex. So there's your cortex there. Whereas the middle portion is called then the medulla. Um, there, we've got some different sections here that you can see the cortex is out here on the outside. Medulla has these kind of different uh, shapes in here. So we've got renal columns and that's just kind of these in-between por portions here. And then you've got these renal, uh, these renal pyramids here in the renal medulla as well. So that's what these are pointing to, these kind of triangular shaped portions of the renal medulla are your, ren your renal pyramids. Your renal pelvis is just this center region. You can see what's gonna happen is this filtration, or really I should just say this urine formation is gonna take place in here in the cortex and, and that's gonna be then filtered down to the renal pelvis, which is kind of the opening, just the, um, the collecting portion of our kidney. That's going to be, you can see how it kind of opens then to the ureter, and that's where all this urine will come from. The renal pelvis is going to be what will grab that urine. So we'll talk about that as we continue further here. Um, the renal capsule is simply just the outer portion of the kidney itself. It is kind of in this membranous capsule. It's just, again, the cortex itself is part of the kidney. The capsule is the membrane on the outside. Uh, we've talked about many different organs that have a membrane on the outside of it, like our lungs had the, uh, the visceral pleura. Um, you know, we had, we had all kinds of different things. The, the pericardium on the outside of the heart, you know, pretty much everything has that just layer that sits on the outside of it. And that's what we're looking at here. That's what the capsule is. Our blood supply, as I already mentioned at the very beginning, talks about how the artery brings that blood in, the renal vein brings that blood out. Don't forget artery, we remembered A for away, but it was A from uh, away from the heart. So this is blood coming away from the heart. Um, so it's coming towards the kidneys now in this case. So renal artery is what brings that blood in, the vein is what takes it out. All right, so what is our kidney gonna do for us? Our, we've got two of them, most of us have two of them. It's okay to have just one, um, but most of us have two of them. They regulate our blood volume and electrolytes. So they're in the process of filtering out water, 
Um, we're also filtering out things like sodium and potassium, and those are electrolytes, um, but all kinds of ions and waste products, um, different nitrogenous waste that we'll get to. Uh, and, and in a sense, that also is gonna help to balance out that. If we have too much water, we're gonna filter out more water. If we don't have enough water, we're gonna filter less. So that's what the kidneys are doing. It's helping to regulate that blood volume as well as our electrolyte balance as well. Um, it's gonna regulate our acid-base balance. Um, some of the waste products that we get rid of are acids. If our blood becomes too acidic, we can get very, very sick from that. Um, if our blood becomes too alkaline, we can get very sick from that too. Um, so our blood pH is typically in the middle. Um, and so our kidneys are gonna help to filter out some of those wastes if we need to get rid of that acid or hang on to some if our blood's becoming too alkaline. So for the most part, we're usually getting rid of uh, that waste product called uric acid and it is an, it is an acid, uh, as well as any other nitrogenous waste product. So that's what that's referred to. Any of the waste that we're talking about that we're removing here in the kidney uh, is called a nitrogenous waste. Uh, helps to regulate blood pressure in the same way. Um, you know, when we're filtering out things like sodium, um, we're helping to, you know, lower our blood pressure. Sometimes we hang on to sodium because we need to increase our blood pressure. Um, same in water, our blood volume has a direct effect on that too. Sometimes when we um, are retaining sodium for whatever reason, maybe we don't have enough sodium in our blood and our blood pressure is starting to drop. Our kidneys know to hang on to some sodium to get our blood pressure back to normal. In the same case, it's also taking that, you know, absorb, or we're um, hanging on to water, which helps with blood pressure as well. Um, and it helps to regulate our red blood cell production. We do have um, erythropoietin, that is the hormone that is created here by the kidneys that will target the red uh, bone marrow in our bones to tell uh, our bones to create more red blood cells in the event that we need some. So because blood is constantly being filtered through the kidneys, the kidneys do have that availability and that uh, recognition uh, of that to know when our red blood cells are low. So that's, that's another thing that our kidneys will do for us. So our kidneys have all, all kinds of wonderful functions that are gonna help our body tremendously. So within each kidney, the functional unit inside the kidney is called a nephron. Um, as I mentioned in the um, very beginning, when the introduction, I was uh, mentioned to you guys that there's a million nephrons in every kidney. So they're very, very, very microscopic. We can barely see them. But because there's a million of those, that this, this, these three processes of urine creation are actually taking place in every single one of these nephrons. So each nephron is actively working. It's kind of like Santa's workshop and there's all kinds of elves actively working. Super silly analogy, I know. But that's what's happening here. All of these nephrons are in the process of creating urine and then eventually you know as they create it they're filtering it down towards the ureters and the ureters are just collecting these so again in my silly analogy the elves are constantly making toys putting them on the conveyor belt and those toys are eventually being collected to be put into santa's sack we're going to call that the bladder super silly and ridiculous but whatever works right so all these nephrons are, comp are composed of two different parts we have what's called renal tubules and then we have renal blood vessels. Let's take a look at what this looks like. Um, with the renal tubules, I'll show you guys that there's, there's a couple different parts of it. There's what's called the Bowen's capsule, loop of Henle, and the collecting duct. What the heck does that mean? Here's what, this is look, what we're looking at here. So taking this kidney, again, there's a million of these in each kidney, and it's pointing out this functional unit right here. This is what a nephron looks like, this, this guy down here at the bottom. I mentioned that there's what's called renal tubules, so these, li these little yellow tubes that are kind of going all over the place. Those are those renal tubules that I was mentioning. And then we have paratubular capillaries that are surrounding those tubules. So all these different capillaries, again, we know that they're blood capillaries because again, we're seeing the red and the blue. Uh, so it's showing us there that these are capillaries. And again, keep in mind that there's a million of these in, in the nephron. So it's this, it's here 
where this urine formation is going to take place. And again, that takes place in a three-step process. Up here at the top, this is showing you the nephron as well, but it's showing it to you in kind of a simplified formation that if we took that nephron and we kind of spaced it out a little bit and showed it to you um, a little bit differently, this is showing you what's going to take place. What's going to happen? When the renal artery brings that blood into the kidney, it will then branch off into these different arterioles. Remember, arteries become smaller and become arterioles, and eventually will become capillaries. The capillaries in each nephron are then, are actually formed into this tight little ball called a glomerulus. So that's this, this ball of capillaries right here is pointing to the glomerulus. So you can see it in both images. There's the glomerulus, and then there's the glomerulus up there at the top. This is actually where filtration takes place. That again, we know that capillaries are so thin walled that any and everything can get through, you know, as, as long as it fits. Um, so we're not losing red blood cells, but any water, ions, you know, salts, any, anything, white waste products, whatever, is gonna go through this glomerulus and we'll now call it filtrate as it's then being captured by this capsule called the glomerular capsule or sometimes referred to as Bowman's capsule. That capsule is the first part of these renal tubules that is catching all this filtrate from this first stage of urine creation called filtration. What's gonna happen is now that filtrate will then travel through these renal tubules. You can see the direction it's gonna flow. So here's the arrows up here at the top showing you. It's gonna then flow and eventually try to make its way here to the collecting duct, which is gonna be you know, connected to different nephrons. So as you can see here at this bottom picture, there's a couple different openings for more connections. So as it's traveling through this renal tubule, this is where that double check takes place. In this process, we're gonna double check. We're gonna make sure we keep all the good stuff that we need, that's gonna be called reabsorption. And then we're gonna make sure we get rid of all the things we definitely need to in a process called secretion. So I'll get into that a little bit further. The PowerPoint is gonna define that a little bit more, but I wanted you guys to see this picture of this nephron to see exactly what's taking place. Here in the glomerulus, that's where that filtration, that blood traveling through this ball of capillaries it's wound into this tight ball so that pressure is you know even even greater here in that glomerulus so all kinds of things are filtering out and being grabbed up by that bowman's capsule that filtrate will now continue to move through the renal tubule so the renal tubule has a couple different parts if you see this um, this is this whole thing is the tubule before it reaches this collecting duct when it refers to the proximal convoluted tubule convoluted because it's all windy it's all kind of over the place and it's called proximal because remember proximal means closest to the point of attachment so this is where it attaches to the glomerulus so that's why this is called the proximal convoluted tubule then what happens is it distends right or it descends i should say not distends descends uh in you know into what's called the loop of henley so we know that it looks like a loop so that's why it's called the loop of henley and then that filtrate will ascend, so it will go up and then make its way into the distal convoluted tubule. Again, convoluted because it's all windy all over the place. And it's distal because it's further from that glomerulus. It's further from that point of attachment. So remember those two terms meant proximal, closest to the point of attachment, or remember we said closer in proximity, or distal, again, and then, I'm sorry, not or, but and distal, the other term meant um, a further distance from that point of attachment. So that's where those terms are coming from and hopefully those are familiar to us. But those are all part of that renal tubule. Um, so again, I mentioned that it's here in the renal tubule that we're gonna see that double check of urine production take place. Let's talk a little bit further about that. So the nephron, again, has different blood vessels. We had the renal artery that was bringing that into the kidney. That artery, again, will eventually become arterioles. Let's talk about the difference between afferent and efferent. So they're at the, at the glomerulus. So it's kind of showing you the order that that goes in, that there, it's the renal artery that brings that blood into the kidney. That renal artery gets smaller and smaller and eventually becomes the afferent arterial. What do I mean by afferent? Remember, afferent means, 
Well, we talked about afferent versus efferent in the nervous system. We talked about how A comes before E. That part of the arteriole is actually what goes towards the glomerulus. So there's the first part. Once it filters through that glomerulus, then that arteriole that's leaving, it's still an arteriole as it leaves the glomerulus and is now called the efferent because it's leaving that, uh, you know, that, e that, um, that I'm sorry, the glomerulus. And it's eventually going to then become paratubular capillaries, which are the ones that, that intertwine in between those tubules. And then the renal vein is what takes the blood out of the kidney. So going back to that picture, let's show you guys that again. So here red, this big guy down here is that renal artery that's bringing that blood into the kidney. Here you can see as it gets smaller, there it becomes the afferent arterial as it takes blood towards that glomerulus. There in that glomerulus, we're gonna see some filtration take place, but still we have, again, it's still an arterial as it's still moving away from the heart, we're still then making its way through the rest of this nephron. So that's where it will then become these paratubular capillaries. So that's where the difference is, the afferent arteriole, and then as it leaves the glomerulus, it's called the efferent arteriole. Here are all the paratubular capillaries that intertwine here amongst this renal tubule of the nephron, and then eventually it will become the renal vein that will take, its, take that blood out of the kidney. So that's what I mean by the different blood vessels here within the nephron. Again, there are three steps in urine formation. So we talked a little bit about glomerular filtration. We'll talk a little bit more about that. That's that first stage where blood is gonna go through that glomerulus, push all kinds of stuff out of blood, but then there's, here's our double check. We've got taking place within that renal tubule, we have tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion. Let's talk about each of these. So first, we have glomerular filtration. So water as well as, so a lot of water, all kinds of water coming out of blood. As it fits through this glomerulus, through, through that capillary wall, it's, you know, it's again, it's going to fit through. So water as well as any dissolved solutes, excuse me, will filter across that glomeruli. So glomeruli just, again, is plural for all the glomeruli because, again, there's millions of these in the kidney. We'll filter across the glomeruli and into Bowman's capsule. Filtration occurs for a number of different reasons, but mainly because here it occurs when the pressure on one side of the membrane is greater than the pressure on the opposite, it will try to filter towards the opposite side. So the pressure is so great inside that glomerulus, as I mentioned, because it's, in, it's kind of a tight ball of capillaries, so pressure is greater, it's going to push things out with that pressure. So all kinds of substances are filtered. Um, so things that, you know, and I had said that filtration occurs for a number of reasons, but that's the main reason, again, that it's, it's you know, pushing because of that pressure. But all kinds of, uh, you know, what I meant to say with that is all kinds of substances are being filtered out. Not that you have to worry about every single little substance, but just to get an idea about what urine is going to be made up of, um, what's coming through that filtration is everything pretty much anything again that can filter through. Uh, like I said, large blood cells, large proteins, things that are too big to fit through that filter aren't gonna, aren't gonna make its way through. But water, um, some electrolytes, sodium and potassium, chloride, um, glucose fits through, uric acid is a waste product. All these things can pass very easily. So all these things are gonna filter out in this first stage of urine production called glomerular filtration. We can actually test the filtration rate. Uh, there's, there's a certain rate that can be read called GFR. Um, this is the rate at which water and solute are filtered out of that glomerulus. So blood pressure actually helps to determine that glomerular filtration rate. A normal glomerular filtration rate is about 180 liters of water in a day, which equates to a few you know, reduce that down to per minute, that's about 125 milliliters of water per minute. Um, so that's telling you that there's, again, there's a lot of water coming out of the glomerulus um, all at one time. It's, you know, or not all at one time, but in this first stage, we're taking a lot of water out, but we're not going to end up excreting all of that water. If you think 180 liters of water in a day, that's a lot. Think about how much liquid is in a two liter. 
Okay, take that 180 and divide it by two to tell you how many two liters that would be. That's 92 liters. I definitely do not urinate 92 liters of water, right? Not gonna happen. What's gonna happen is that's where those two stages are gonna come in, the, two, the double check. Reabsorption is gonna be huge here in this next step. So here we first have that glomerular filtration. Like I said, a normal glomerular filtration rate is about 180 liters of water a day. So then we have tubular reabsorption. Here's where our double check comes in. This is gonna return the filtrate, so as it's, again, we call it filtrate as it's traveling through that renal tubule, the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, that, you know, what I showed you in that picture. What's going to happen is filtrate will be able to pass through the wall of that tubule uh, into the blood, into those paratubular capillaries that are right there intertwined with that tubule. Most reabsorption will actually take place in the first part, in that proximal convoluted tubule. Um, the kidney actually chooses the type and quantity of substances that it reabsorbs. Um, it's, and it could be the presence of, of different hormones. We'll talk about our hormone control. If you remember, we talked about how the antidiuretic hormone is what helps us to reabsorb water when we need more. Um, if I've had a whole bunch of water all day, then I may be excreting a lot more water. But if I haven't, then the kidney is going to choose for me to hang on to more water and in this stage of reabsorption we're going to reabsorb more water so it's all based on kind of where i am in the day you know again if i haven't had enough water then we're going to need to reabsorb more than normal so the kidney kind of chooses that and we'll talk about how hormones play a role in that too so what is reabsorbed? We reabsorb um, about 99% or a little bit, maybe even more, about 99% of the sodium that was lost in filtration. 99% of that water that was lost in filtration. To talk about water a little bit further, so we talked about how our glomerular filtration rate um, on the, you know, in the previous stage was about 180 liters of water per day. Well, a typical average healthy adult typically will excrete about 1.5 liters of water per day. So close to a two liter, we're talking about just kind of analogies here in comparison. Um, so we typically will excrete 1.5 liters per day, which means that in a, a normal person, if normal glomerular filtration rate is 180 liters per day, normal urination rate is 1.5 liters per day, that means we are reabsorbing 178.5 liters in a day. So that tells you that again, reabsorption is huge. Reabsorption is we're taking in a majority of that water that was lost during filtration. We're gonna take a lot of that back. All that stuff that filtered out, that's good. We're trying to, you know, again, filter through just to make sure, but a lot of that water we're gonna take back. 100% of the glucose is taken back. Urea, 50% creatinine. These are some waste products that are sometimes things we need to remove from our body. Uh, so we're actually not gonna reabsorb that. So that's that's not coming back. That's gonna stay in the renal tubule. So just to kind of tell you why, you know, what we're doing, we're, we're reabsorbing a lot of the things that we need to hang on to. The last step is just, let's make sure we get rid of all the things we need to, and we need to make sure that the blood is excreting everything that we can. So this is gonna move very small amounts of select substances from those paratubular capillaries back into the tubules. So a couple substances would be like potassium ions. Sometimes we need to, to excrete some potassium, hydrogen ions, uric acid, ammonium ions, and certain drugs. So chemicals that we might be taking, medications, are oftentimes filtered out in this stage. Um, so this is our last step, that tubular secretion. So we're removing all the things we need to. Like I said, filtration, we're filtering out everything we can. And then in these two stages, reabsorption, we're taking, you know, the blood is going to take back all the things that we want to hang on to and not remove in urine. And then secretion is that last step. Let's make sure we're getting everything we need to excrete into urine so that it can be excreted. So those are our three stages there, filtration, reabsorption, and then secretion. So remember we talked about how sometimes um, reabsorption can be um, determined based on hormone control. So a couple different hormones that hopefully this is 
a refresher from, from our uh, endocrine system chapter. Aldosterone, if you remember, was secreted by the adrenal cortex. Um, what this will do is this will work on the distal tubule and upper collecting duct of that nephron unit. Remember, this is our salt retaining hormone. This is our hormone that is excreted when we need to hang on to more sodium. So that's what it does for us. It targets that renal, that, that, that tubule, makes sure that in that reabsorption that we are reabsorbing sodium. In turn, if we have to reabsorb sodium, we are more than likely going to then retain water. Um, so this is going to increase our blood volume. It's also going to increase our blood pressure. But the reason why we need to reabsorb sodium may be because our blood pressure is low. So there's a reason why this is happening. So aldosterone is going to make sure we do that. Don't forget about the antidiuretic hormone. Remember, this was our uh, water regulator that came from the pituitary gland. So this is released by the posterior pituitary in response to low blood volume or high concentration. So meaning that we maybe don't have enough water, but maybe we have a lot of other, other substances in our blood. So water is going to move out of the collecting duct and into the tissue spaces around that and then eventually into the paratubular capillary. So this is going to make sure that we are reabsorbing the water we need to. Again, this is in the event that maybe we haven't had a lot of glasses of water today. So our antidiuretic hormone is gonna make sure that we retain as much water as we can. So ADH will decrease the excretion of water and cause the excretion of a more concentrated urine because we're getting rid of a lot of those substances. One hormone that I think we may have briefly mentioned at the end of our endocrine system, I think I maybe just talked about it. So I may not have, I know I didn't test you guys on this, but um, the heart itself actually recognizes when our blood pressure is high. So we have what's called natriuretic peptides. I think in the endocrine system le lecture, I may have referred to it as the um, atrial natriuretic factor. I think other books reference it that way. Um, but that's what it does is it recognizes that our blood pressure is high. So this is going to cause the excretion of sodium. A lot of times sodium is what causes our blood pressure to be high. So we need to get it out. So the heart will excrete this natriuretic pept peptide that will target and make sure that we're eliminating as much sodium as we can. So it's secreted by the walls of the atria within the heart again in response to blood volume and blood pressure. Uh, this is secreted by the walls of the ventricles in response to an elevated ventricular volume. So our heart itself can create this, de depending on what exactly it is, tells us what part of the heart it comes from. If, if it's increased blood volume, the walls of the atria will secrete it. Uh, if it's an elevated ventricular volume, so in the ventricles, the ventricles themselves will secrete these peptides but I would know what those peptides do, that they're gonna cause that excretion of sodium. Okay, so what is, what is urine made up of? So uh, the volume average, we typically will urinate, will typically excrete about 1500 milliliters, which is the same thing as 1.5 liters. So what I was telling you guys earlier, about a little less than a two liter per day. Um, in the event that maybe we don't secrete enough or we are, we are eliminating too much, oliguria is when a person is not producing enough urine. So if urine production is less than 400 milliliters per day, then there may be something going on. And so that's, that's meaning we're not secreting enough urine as we should. Uh, polyuria is the opposite. So if we are going over that 1.5 liters, the, the 1500 milliliters, then that's what polyuria is. This mean, it means that the person is producing too much urine. And there could be other reasons for this. It could be um, that we just drank an entire gallon of water, but it could be a number of different um, diseases or some uh, other circumstances. So that needs to be looked at. Um, our average um, pH, pH as I mentioned, um, of blood is typically pretty neutral. Uh, urine is a little bit more on the acidic side, uh, so it ranges anywhere from five to eight. I don't know if I've told you guys, but the pH scale is one to 14, lower numbers are more acidic, and 14 higher are more uh, alkaline numbers, more basic. So, you know, it's kind of somewhat in the middle, but a little bit more on the lower side, so anywhere between, like I said, six is pretty average, so anywhere between five and eight. Specific gravity, this is just talking about the density. Urine is slightly heavier than water. You don't have to know those specific numbers. 
Typically it's about, it's, it's amber or straw colored, so a little bit yellowish. A deep yellow may sometimes signify that it's, you know, a person is dehydrated, where if it's more of a pale yellow, that's maybe signifying overhydration. So you, amber is pretty normal. All right. Um, so no urine, what is that all about? So there's a difference between what's called urinary retention and renal suppression. Urinary retention, retention, I'm sorry, the kidneys are producing urine as they should. In this case, maybe the bladder won't empty. Maybe there's something going on with either the bladder or perhaps even the urethra. It could be that in males, sometimes males who are experiencing prostate issues, the prostate, as you saw in that picture, is kind of wrapped around the urethra, tucked underneath the bladder, and sometimes that causes a problem. Um, so in urinary retention, the kidneys are working fine. It's just the bladder won't empty. So here catheterization or sometimes even, med even medications um, are gonna be what's gonna help to fix that. Renal suppression, on the other hand, this is when the urine is not being produced. So kidneys are not producing urine. Um, a patient develops uremia, which is blood in the urine. Uh, I'm sorry, um, showing that there's urine in the blood. So the treatment for this would be dialysis. So uremia is, is urine in the blood uh, resulting from renal failure. So re renal suppression is renal failure. If, you're, if your kidneys are not working properly, then it is renal failure. So dialysis, there's actually two different ways that dialysis takes place. Essentially what dialysis is, is your kidneys aren't working properly, so your, your filters of your body are not working. So we need an artificial filter. So in hemodialysis, um, what's gonna happen is, as you can see in this first picture, blood is actually gonna be removed from this patient and it's gonna be passed into, we're gonna kinda look at this as kind of an artificial filter, an artificial kidney, that it's passed into this um, substance called uh, dialysate, which is uh, a mixture of different, uh, it's a commercially prepared solution of water and different electrolytes, kind of similar to the body's substances. But it's gonna help to then, what's gonna happen is waste is automatically gonna filter out of that blood, and then we're gonna, it's gonna be pushed back into the person's body. In peritoneal analysis, uh, analysis and peritoneal dialysis. This will work very similarly, but what happens is that dialysate fluid um, is going to be pushed into the peritoneum cavity, so the abdominal cavity of this person, uh, of the patient, and their own peritoneal membranes, with our, which are the membranes that are around their abdominal organs, are going to act as that dialysizing membrane. After some time, that fluid will then be removed, so because it will have that waste in it. So you can see here, here's the person who is finished with that and now, now has collected waste. Um, dialysis is a very time consuming, no matter what type of dialysis a patient is experiencing, um, dialysis is typically a very time consuming procedure um, because your kidneys are not acting normal. So because we're having to then, you know, pretend to be a kidney, we're having to pass this through the blood through an artificial kidney. Um, typically dialysis lasts for about four hours at a time and is have, it, it typically has to be done every third day. So it can be very time consuming for a patient. Um, so it's something that no one would want to go through and we know that patients, are, our future patients are not gonna wanna go through that, but that's what they're experiencing when they experience renal failure. So here's the rest of, after the nephron, what happens after that? So the nephron, again, as I mentioned, will then attach to those different collecting tubules, as you saw in that picture. Um, it, in that picture, it showed that there were other openings for other nephrons. It's those collecting tubules, those collecting ducts, that will actually then empty that filtrate. It's now gonna be called urine after those three stages of urine production have take, taken place. Um, it's now called urine and urine will be get collected by those collecting ducts and those collecting ducts will empty into the renal pelvis of the kidney and the renal pelvis attaches to the ureters. The ureters, again, through peristalsis, will pump that urine down to the bladder. Then the urinary bladder will hang on to that temporarily. This picture is showing you that bladder, again, just like the stomach, 
the bladder is made up of that rugi, that inner lining. And again, that's gonna allow it to expand and hold more urine. Um, and then when that fills, it will send a signal to our brain that we need to release that, we need to empty that, and it will exit through the urethra. So that's the rest of that. So what happens is the bladder fills, it stimulates stretch receptors. Um, those receptors will send a sensory signal to our spinal cord and then a motor signal. So remember, sensory goes towards our central nervous system. So motor or efferent will then come to the bladder. Um, the contraction of the bladder and will take place. You know, we go to the bathroom and we have the then internal sphincter. Remember, sphincter is just a ring of muscles that we can relax. We voluntarily relax that. Uh, and that will open that up to allow urine to travel through the urethra and out through the urinary, mes the urinary meatus. So urethra, again, is the tube that carries urine from the bladder to the outside. Um, the muscular layer of that urethra will then contract to actually help to expel urine during urination, also known as what's called micturition. If you ever see that term micturition, it just means urination, sometimes called voiding too. If you ever hear that term as voiding, it just means going to the bathroom. All right, guys. So that is the end of our urinary system. So that one was kind of short and sweet. I know that our labeling was short and sweet for that. Um, so hopefully that helps you guys with that chapter. If you guys have any questions, you guys know, reach out to me anytime.